So I pass the floor to you, Dr. Yasir. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yasir. Okay, thank you, Dr. so much for uh, especially, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk that I can present something to you. I mean, my idea and my research, whatever I have done so far uh, during my research, as well as obviously uh, all not related to my research, but also some of the things are from the general idea. So uh, today topic, uh, I will be talking on introduction to diffraction imaging. So it's a way forward for high resolution fracture imaging. Not really the only the fracture, but castification, carbonate. So this type of complex structure, even the salt body deposit also we have, we have been working on that. So the diffraction imaging gives a better and very good results in these cases. So my name is uh, Dr. Yasser, as you know that. So I'm a geophysics lecturer, senior lecturer as a researcher in University Science Malaysia. So uh, before I start the presentation, so this is the agenda or the outline of my presentation for today. So as this topic is mostly related to the introduction, so I will be focusing uh, or maybe the start of the time, I will be focusing on understanding diffractions. How, what are the diffraction and how does they produce? How does it look like? Because diffraction, if we talk the general diffraction hyperbola, so you will see it's a hyperbolic shape. But in some cases at different depth, different velocity, different frequency, so the diffraction will behave differently. So that's why we have to understand how does it look like at a different velocity, different depth and different uh, scenario. Then we will move to the how to image these diffractions. So obviously for imaging diffractions, if we image together with reflection, so there are some certain uh, point, I mean, because normally when we are migrating our data, which is together with reflection and diffraction, so you will not be getting that much information, uh, which is coming from the diffractions of the uh, subsurface or the diffraction diffracted waves. So for that purpose, um, I will explain uh, how to we separate the diffractions. So there are multiple methods. So I'm not sure in industry software which we are using, but with regard to the, I mean, the re research and the methods, I will explain and what are the benefits of that uh, methods and what are the drawbacks of that methods. Then obviously we'll be looking at high resolution imaging. Then I will introduce a little bit about machine learning approach uh, in diffraction detection. So normally when you're doing manually, uh, so it will be hard to understand the diffractions. So the machine learning is a new technology. I mean, uh, you already know that, I mean, value scan is also using a lot of features of machine learning and your developers might have more capabilities to develop this machine learning approach to detect the diffraction. So in machine learning, uh, I'll explain further. So there's two methods uh, or the two uh, way of doing machine learning. One is the image segmentation, either we input the image or the multi-domain diffraction identification. Then finally, I will conclude my presentation or the lecture. So uh, I believe that we, we can have an interactive session because this is not a very formal talk. So um, whenever you feel anything is confusing or you want to ask any questions so you can just interrupt me you can turn on your mic and you can ask me any question so let's look at the diffraction pattern in daily life so how does diffractions look like so diffraction is not only in the seismic but in daily life if you look at this figure so you can see this is a night time and you can see here is a light source Right here, you can see the direct light, which is in between this uh, point. So this is actually the direct source of the light. But when you see these lights, which is in the, uh, as a, we, we call it, it's a diffracted light because it's the diffraction is happening because of some edges. Let's say this light was in the room and you have the window. So from the 
sharp edges of the window, the light will be diffracted. So the second example is also again from one building. So you can see here, you can see you, normally the direct light is not like this. But you can see here, there's a lot of diffractions in the lights. So on the top, you can see this red light. So this appears to be a static form. So these statics or the uh, the wider range of this um, area is a diffracted light. So similar things happen in our daily life. If we look at the early morning after the sunrise or the sunset in the evening. So you can see when the light is passing through this tree. So we still can't see the direct light, but we can see the diffracted light here. And similarly, when the sun is already set or it's not rise in the morning, but it's still you can see the light in uh, light in the um, in the region, but that is not the direct light. It's a diffracted light. So that's same thing. Also, we can apply to the uh, sound wave. But if you look at the seismic, so in seismic the diffractions appears to be like this. So you can see this appears to be like hyperbola. But how it can become more complex when there is a multiple diffraction lights. So similarly, like here, if we don't know it's a one source of light or there is multiple source, but you can see the diffractions appears to be like this on the other side. So similarly, in seismic, what happens? So the red arrow shows one of the diffraction hyperbola. But when you see here, so these are also the diffraction hyperbola from the edges of one salt body. So let's understand um, what is actually the diffraction is. So if you look at the definition, uh, so the process by which a beam of light or the other system of the wave is spread out as a result of passing through a narrow aperture or across an, a, an edge is typically accompanied by the interference between the wave form produced. So this is a basic definition. I mean, if you look at the Google, so the, you will find this definition. But when we look at the uh, diffraction, which is explained by Summerfield, which is a which is a geophysicist, so he say that any deviation of light rays from rectilinear path, which cannot be interpreted as a reflection or refraction. So. According to Summerfield, he says this is a different phenomenon rather than the diffraction, rather than the reflection or refraction. So when you will record your data in the subsurface during the acquisition, so you will not be able to interpret as a reflection or refraction. So that is this third part diffraction. Then there is another definition of uh, uh, diffraction by Landu. So he said that the phenomena which are consequence of deviation from the geometrical optics. So it either can be a fault, it can be fractures or it's a discontinuity or any form of sudden change. Even if you have the lithology change or the uh, what we call the velocity change within the layer, so you will still just see the diffraction. I, I'm going to show some of the example of that one as well. So uh, another uh, statement is that no one has been explained or able to define the difference between interference and diffraction satisfactory. So a lot of people are confused with the interference and diffraction. So we have to get to understand what is the interference and the diffraction. So these are two different phenomena. So normally in interference, what happened, there are two waves of the same kind of overlap to produce a relevant resultant wave. So in this case, interference case, we have the two wave, but in diffraction, what happens? So it's a bending of the wave around the corners. So I'll give you one example. So like here, uh, let's consider the sound wave because we are using also the sound wave in uh, seismic exploration. So let's say on the left side figure, you have this radio here, and this is a person or the listener here. 
So supposedly when we draw this um, on the right side, so let's say this is your radio and this is a person. So supposedly the sound waves should travel in this direction or either in this direction or this direction. But what happened when this sound waves tra travel or it goes, it hit to this edges, edge of the wall, I mean this edge of the wall, so there is a diffracted sounds produced. So what is the difference between this sound waves and this sound wave is actually the amplitude decay. The amplitude, amplitude of the waves will be higher on this direct sound path. And on the other side, you will have the amplitude decay. So that's why in diffraction hyperbola, you will observe that you have the maximum amplitude at the top and with the time uh, and both of the flanks you will see the decay in amplitude so now this this is was about the sound waves so now let's look at the light how does it goes so this is an example again so let's say if you have the light source here which is the red point and it is passing through a slit you know the slit which has a hole in the uh, in the slit. So it, when it is passing through this slit, so supposedly what we should have on the other side, so supposedly what we should have, we should have the direct light and the dark portion. But in real, what we observe, we have the direct light and the, we have the direct light over here, which is in red and the dark portion is in black. But in between direct light and the dark portion, we still can see a diffracted light. So what is the source of this diffracted light? So actually the source of diffracted light is this edge. So now how we can, if we, you have been able to understand the diffractions in the light or in the sound, then only we can apply to the seismic. So I believe that it's clear to you. If you have any question, you can even ask in between. So the source of this diffracted light is actually this edge. So you can see these edges of this, this slit. So when we apply this principle into the seismic, so let's say if we have the source and receiver geometry on the top, and we have a discontinuous reflector, which is over here, you can see the black line, solid line. So when we acquire the data on the surface, so you can see this is, this will produce a reflection. I mean, this receiver, this receiver, this, and this one. Probably only two receiver will receive the reflection, but this one and this one will receive the diffracted lights, diffracted waves, actually. So you can see this diffracted waves will be happening on the edge of this reflector and also on the other side of the reflector. And if the second phenomena is happening, so you can see the amplitude which is off reflector is a negative and on reflector, sorry, on reflector, it will be a positive and off reflect, on reflector, it will be negative amplitude. So when we separate out this diffraction and we migrate this diffraction hyperbola, then you can only uh, find out the edges of this uh, reflection. So as you know that the, the Snell laws is actually I is equal to R, which is I is the angle of reflection, angle of incidence and angle of reflections over here. So in reflection, what happened if you have the subsurface reflector here? So reflection satisfy the Snell's law. So angle of incidence and this is the angle of reflection. But what happened when it reaches to this point, which is the edge? So when it reaches to this point, so the angle of incidence is not equal to angle of reflection because it becomes smaller and sometimes it's larger because the waves goes in each direction. So that's why the diffraction does not follow the Snell's law. So that's the um, biggest understanding um, Key, key point of this, uh, I mean, understanding as well. So now let's look at the logic behind the diffraction. So what are the, I mean, logic? 
So if you look at the diffraction hyperbola, it can be explained by the Huygen Fresnel principle because it does not follow the uh, Snell's law, but it follows the Huygen principle, Huygen Fresnel principle. So there are two parameters on which the diffraction depends. So one of them is the wavelength. And the second thing is the size of discontinuity. So actually these two things are interrelated because when we are changing the size of the discontinuity or a slit, then it means we are changing the wavelength. But in this figure, I will explain more detail. So let's say this is a wave passing through here. So this, this is the yellow color is of a reflector. And when you see this wave is passing through this hole in reflector model, so how does it behave when the hole is a small? I mean, this part is a small, but when in the case of big hole or the, or the wavelength is larger, then what happens to this one? So it also says the angle of diffraction is directly proportional to the size of wavelength. So let's say if your wavelength, so in this case, the wavelength is smaller, then your angle of diffraction will be higher. If the wavelength is smaller, uh, wavelength is uh, bigger, then your angle of diffraction will be smaller. So why this happen? Because the wavelength is, if the wavelength is much smaller, then the width of the dis discontinuity will not interact. I mean, this part. So from this, uh, we can say that if, let's say if we have the high frequency signal, then obviously we have the small wavelength. So because of this small wavelength, then the angle of diffraction will be lower. I mean, this will not be spreading out a lot. But if we have the low frequency, so it's been the long wavelength, then the higher angle of diffraction we will receive. So that's the, I mean, understanding of uh, basic uh, diffraction. How does it, how does it uh, can be judged or how it can be observed? So after this, actually, uh, this was a quite interesting things. So I have also plotted this diffraction hyperbola based on different depth and velocity. So you will be thinking, why? what is the effect of depth and velocity on the diffractions? So this is the first example or the first model which I have created. Um, it's a diffraction hyperbola when the velocity of the hyperbola is 2000 meter per second. So the hyperbola velocity is same, but you can see this hyperbola is at one kilometer depth. Then the second one is a uh, two kilometer. Then third one is three kilometer and four kilometer. So if you observe closely to this hyperbolas, so you can see the curvature of this hyperbola is more, but when it reaches to four kilometer, it's become less cur curvature. It's not clear here, but let's say, let me increase the velocity. So when I increase the velocity to 3,500 meter per second. So in this case, you can observe the hyperbola at one kilometer and four kilometer is very different. So I keep increasing the velocity, which is actually the 5,000 meter per second, which is normal, normal case we have. So at one kilometer, the same hyperbola curvature is more but here the curvature is becoming less and less. So from here, what we can say that, so the same hyperbola, hyperbolic velocity, if it is going into depth, let's say your target is at four kilometer or three kilometer. So you cannot differentiate either it's a diffraction or it's a reflection. Because so maybe if your, your velocity is much higher, then it become very flat. So you will not observe any of the diffractions. Then also I observe that uh, if the same, so this was the constant velocity of the hyperbola. Then I use the increasing velocity of the hyperbola on different depth. So let's say this is 1000 meter per second, then 1500, 2000, 2500, and 3000 meter per second velocity of the hyperbola. And similarly, so this was the increasing velocity, but I created another model, which is a decreasing velocity. So I assume the velocity is higher here, 3000, and this is 1000 meter per second velocity. 
So now you can you can see the difference. So the same hyperbolic velocity of this hyperbola, which is 1000 meter second at five kilometer and the same hyperbola here is at one kilometer depth. So you can see this hyperbola and this hyperbola is behaving differently, totally differently. So you can see uh, the flanks goes up to eight kilometer from five kilometers. So it's almost three kilometer flanks of the hyperbola. But in this case, the hyperbolic move out or the hyperbola's uh, flanks are up to seven kilometer. So that's the understanding how you can create. Obviously, we don't have this less velocity, but if you assume less than 2000 meter per second velocity, so you, you can also look at this in your data set, which is the real uh, data you can observe. So from this uh, experiment, we conclude that, so the seismic diffraction is not only depending on the velocity, but also the depth. So the velocity is one of the factor, but the second factor of the velocity is depth. And the third, which is coming from the previous one, so it's also depend on the frequency. So now we have understand. So there are three factors which we have to be well counted. So the first thing is the frequency or the wavelength is either way. And the second thing is the velocity and third thing is the depth. So in case of complex velocity model, so you will be having different behavior, but if you're going to carbonate field or the fracture basement, so it will be totally different. <clears throat> so um, how does the diffraction produce actually? So this is a simple example, uh, just to give you an idea how the diffraction produce. So let's say if we have the point diffractor here and we have the source and reflector on the surface. So this is, let's say, first reflector or first receiver, second, third, and so on, seven. So you know that when the waves goes in, in the subsurface, it goes into uh, all, all direction. So when it hit to this point diffractor, so it will diffract from this and reach to all receiver. I mean, it's not going to only one re receiver. If it is a reflection, then it has only the one direction. But in the case of diffraction, so we have to be reaching to all direction. So when we record here this uh, travel time, so we only have the information of the time. So let's say this this at this receiver, receiver one, we receive this wave at one second. So we will plot it straight away, or the data will be looking like this one. The straight comes to here. Then the second one, which is this one, it will come to this position. And the third one, fourth one, and so on from here. So this data, which is coming point from point diffractor, it will be appearing like a diffraction hyperbola. So that's why a point, which is a point diffractor, will appear as a point diffraction hyperbola. So this is, I mean, the understanding because at this point we don't know anything else the velocity or the or the subsurface geometry we only know the time so that's why we the data which you are looking at the unmigrated data it will show you this diffraction hyperbolas so now we look at the uh, different point diffractor so as i explained in the previous one so let's say if we have the three point diffractors, so you will have the three diffraction hyperbolas, like this one. Just we are understanding the diffraction. So it, these are the different models of the point diffractor. So let's say if we have the series of point diffractor, so it's not a continuous reflector, but actually it's a series of diffraction hyperbola. So then we will receive series of diffractions so you can see this is a part of this diffraction then the second one is here third one and so on but here you will be you will be confused either is a is a continuous reflector or these are the point diffractor but because of the diffraction hyperbola you can say these are not the continuous reflector but it's the uh, it's a point diffractor model so 
let's consider another model, which is the discontinuous reflector. So it's mean this is a reflector, but it's a discontinuous. I mean, over here it's and and it start from in the middle of the section. So when in this case, we will see the reflection over here, but the diffraction hyperbola on the edges of the reflector. If you compare from the previous one, so it also appears to be same, but you can see a lot of diffractions here. So it's representing that either it's a fractures, the small fractures, or the point diffractors. So in case of fracture, also you will be look, you will be up, you will be observing this type of diffractions. So now this one again. Uh, so this is a discontinuous model. So what we call it, these are actually the true diffractions which is coming from the uh, edges of this discontinuous reflector. <clears throat> so then uh, uh, now we move to the fault. So this is actually the fault in point diffracted model. So let's say if you have the point diffractors and suddenly you have fault, then again you have the point diffractors over here. So in this case, you will have the diffraction on this point and this point, but in between, because of the fault, you will have a difference in 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 diffractions. So now you can see this is the upper layer and the lower layer. So this is the beauty of I mean diffractions. You can understand each and every uh, discontinuity, either fault, fractures, point diffractors. Then this is again uh, another model, which is a real fault in discontinuous reflector. So in case of continuous reflector, we have only two diffraction hyperbola, which was on the edges of the hyperbola. But in case of fault, so we will be observing three diffractions. So the first diffractions from this point, second, and this third diffraction. So you can see this is the first diffraction then observing the second one and the third one diffraction. So it's coming from this edges of the um, discontinuous reflector. So another model which we can see here, in this we have the two faults. Two faults so we can call horse and graben feature uh, structure as well. So in this case, so this is our model. So you can see this is a reflector. Then this part has been synced down, or maybe you can call it two fold. So from here, it's very obvious that we have four diffraction. So first, second, third, and fourth, and so on. So from here also, we can see four diffraction. But when we image this diffraction, so you can see only the fault points or the discontinuous point will be illuminated. So this is first point, second, third, and fourth. So this is the diffraction image. I'll explain how we can separate this uh, diffraction as well. So the, this is again an, another model which is based on the fracture versus impedance gel. So in this case, if I zoom it in, or maybe you can observe, so you can see this is a diffraction which is on the edges here, but in between you can see a small diffractions. So can you see it? These hyperbolas. Maybe the scale of the image is not uh, good. That's why you, you can't see, but I can see it. Th these are the diffraction hyperbola. Why this is happening? Because of the impedance contrast. So in this layer, you have a different velocity or the impedance contrast, but in between you have a different impedance, and over here it's a different. So in diffraction image, you can see this point, this point darker, but these two points are a bit lighter. So this can explain the impedance jump as well. Um, then also we have the um, how we image this diffraction hyperbola. So I will explain. What is the importance of velocity for diffraction imaging? So let's say this is uh, 
a diffraction hyperbola or the diffraction section which you have received. Now you want to mi migrate this data. So now uh, we already know that the actual velocity of this diffraction hyperbola is 1000 meter per second. But what happened? Because we have to understand what will happen that either if I use the higher velocity or the lower velocity. So let's consider this is the 8000 meter per second, 800 meter per second velocity. So then you can see the flanks, half of the flanks has been uh, has been come up, but still it's not migrated properly at the apex. So then when we are using a bit higher velocity, which is lower than the actual velocity, 900 meter per second, so you can see it's becoming more closer to closer. Then if 950, it's become more closer. But when we are using 1000 meter per second, it's become much more prominent as a diffraction hyperbola. So now here uh, you will understand the velocity is an uh, important part of diffraction imaging. So let's say if you look at the section uh, which shows you it's already migrated, but shows like this part of the diffraction. So you can know that this is not properly migrated or the velocity which is used to migrate is not accurate. Then similarly, if we have the same diffraction hyperbola, which is the velocity is 1000 meter per second. And if it goes wrong, so like we are using the higher velocity. So a bit higher velocity, like 1050 meter per second. So the diffraction hyperbola will convert into parabola. So you will see like a smiley face, but mostly that is happen during the NMO corrections. But in case of migration, also you can see these smiley faces. If we use higher velocity like this one, so you can see the parabola is becoming increasing. So from here, you can get the idea that which velocity um, I mean, the velocity of the section is is accurate or it's higher or lower velocity. So if you see these type of features, so then you can recommend the seismic processor. Either you have to use a bit lower velocity than what you have used. So uh, you will be thinking about why we are considering these diffractions. So let's say if we ignore this diffraction, what will happen to these data? So for this case, I, I have a small example, a very simple example. So in this case, I use a model which have a hole. So the velocity is 1500 meter per second and 3000 meter per second. And the hole was 100 meter. And the, and the what you call, the dx, which is the receiver interval was 10 meter. So it's mean in between this 100 meter. So we have, 10 receivers over here. But when we look at the data, so it does not show any hole in reflector. So it appears to be continuous reflector. Only the thing which can we observe is a diffraction. So you can see here, this diffraction hyperbola actually indicates that there is something wrong. I mean, there is some discontinuity. So when we image these diffractions, then only we can find out this is a hole in reflector. Even if we go beyond this uh, 300 meter, so in, in this case, we have the 30 receivers in between this part. But if you look at the data, so it appears it's a flat reflector, or maybe it shows a very slightly change in this. But the size processor can ignore this part because he will consider, okay, maybe this is a, some other type of noises, so it, he will remove it. Then because of this hole or the fracture or the fault, it will show you the continuous reflect. So that's why the diffraction is very important for seismic processor as well as the interpreter as well. So I'll skip this slide because uh, it's just the, I mean, showing the frequency versus migration aperture. So I'll just skip it. So I'll move to some real case scenario. So let's look at this uh, data, which is uh, from ground penetrating radar. So how does the diffraction looks like in 3D? So these are the patterns which appears to be a diffraction. If you look in 3D section, 
So this is a seismic uh, diffractions. So you can see it appears to be like this. So this is one of the diffraction, then this is a second part. So this is actually the edges of some salt body in the subsurface, which produce the diffraction hyperbolas. So once you have the basic understanding or the on the diffraction, then you can obviously work very closely with that. So this is uh, another example from Geophysics 2009. So over here, this was actually the CMP uh, gather data. So over here, you can see a multiple diffractions in this data, which is it is actually the stack data using multi-focusing. So then after that, you can observe when we separate the diffractions, how the more diffraction has been illuminated here. So if you see, this is a stack section and this is a diffraction section. This is a stack and this is diffraction section. So from here, you still can't see the flanks of the hyperbola in a combined section of the reflection versus plus diffraction. But when you separate it out, so you, you will enhance the quality of diffraction. Or here you can observe or you can interpret is a, as a continuous reflector. But when you look at this diffraction section, so you will see a lot of um, discontinu discontinuities are here actually. So then after this uh, separating diffraction, so they actually image these diffractions. So you can see these, this is actually only the diffracted migrated section. So over here, uh, you can see small faults, fractures in this layer. So you can see even, you can see the smiley faces here. So it means they have used a bit higher velocity. So they, they still have to use some accurate velocity. But once you have the diffraction section, so you can plot this diffraction data on a reflected migration. So from here, this could help you to interpret the faults, fractures, discontinuities in a combined section. If you, if you look at this section and the first section, this is unmigrated, we cannot compare it. The another example, which is the second method is actually uh, multiple signal classification. So it has been applied to the GPR data. So what was the purpose of this uh, project? Uh, the data was to improve the fractures. This is actually the mid uh, CMP gather data. And when they separate the, separate the diffractions, so you can see a lot of diffraction has been illuminated from the data. So once they uh, use this diffraction, um, migration, then they plotted the isolated diffraction and common offset section of the data. So actually the diffraction section is adding values to the uh, to the data. I mean, with um, reflection plus diffraction migrated section, you are still unable to see the false fractures. But once you add these values, you separate the diffraction migrated, so you can overlay that data on the on the reflected migration so then you can easily interpret the faults and fractures more easily so this is uh, music i mean this method is called multiple signal classification then also we can observe a different uh, data set in range limited stack so this this study is, has been performed in Malaysian Basin, which is in, from Sarawak. So this is the range limited offset. So it's from 0 to 780, 780 to 2180. And this is from 2180 to 3580. So this is actually the offset range. So if you look at the upper section from 0 to 2.4, second so you can see this is the near offset near offset then this is a far offset so if you look data a little bit below 
So over here, you can observe the near offset will give you a better ref diffraction response. I mean, obviously near offset has the near offset or the zero offset can be can be give you better diffraction response. So th these are some analyses which I have done uh, during my previous research. Then also I have done some practical, oh, sorry, partial stacks of the data with the diffraction with angle stacks, how we can observe the diffraction in angle stacks before migration. So over here, this is a 4.5 degree, which is a near angle stack. Then this is a mid and this is far 31.5 degree. So from my observation, so you can see here. So the diffraction hyperbola, which is over here, is not properly image. But when you look at the mid and far offset, so you can see a better preservation of diffractions. So from this, I was I have concluded this, and it has been published in in 2018 that the far offset, no, sorry, the the far angle strikes gives you the better diffraction response. And also, if we compare on the the near and far angle, so you can see the diffraction which does not appears in the near angle strike, but in the far angle strikes, it appears more closely. So this is a study which you can do in angle stacks or the offset stacks as well. And why do we preserve this diffraction? So I mean, this is a section which is before preservation of diffraction. So if you focus on this red arrows, so you can't see any hyperbolic hyperbolic move out. When you preserve the diffractions, so you can see the hyperbolas, which is this black amplitude. So this is before and this is after. So when we image this data set, so this is actually the diffracted section. I mean the diffract diffraction preserved in this section, and this is the image section. So even without uh, without migration, you can say this is a fault based on the apex of the amplitude of the diffraction hyperbola. But once you image it, you can see yes, uh, beautifully the fault has been imaged because of this diffractions. Then also I have done some further studies to understand this fracture basement model. So I have extracted a small part of this model, which is actually from Malay Basin. So I, I try to do analysis on different models. So this is one of the basic models so to understand the diffraction and develop the algorithms to separate the diffractions. So I use two models. One is the constant velocity in, in which we have the density contrast, 2000, 2200, 2005, and 2700 kilogram per meter cube. And the second one is a variable velocity, which is follows the same velocity in the model. So acquisition parameter was our distance was 1000 meter. Our depth is 3000, dx is 10 meter, dt is 2 millisecond, and frequency is 50 hertz. So our, on the left side, you can see this was the model. So you just keep in mind. So you can see a lot of diffractions series of diffraction has been produced on the faults. So this is the first fault. I mean, if you look at this is first fault, this is second. And even I don't need to look at the model. When I see this diffraction response, I can I can easily tell that this is the faults or this diffraction produce some of the activity. But when it comes to the complex velocity, I mean the variable velocity, so you can see it's become more complicated. So, so the top one is remain the same, but when it goes down, so you see a lot of diffractions mix up together. So that's why it's difficult to interpret the interpret this data. So for that purpose, we do the separation of these diffractions. So the first method, which is uh, which is a quite uh, quite simplified method, 
which is based on deep frequency filtering. So we convert our data from time domain to frequency domain. So this is the FK transform. Then we filter out the reflections, which is normally at zero cycle per second. So we design a filter which can cancel all this, um, all these frequencies. Yeah. So once we did that, so this is called deep frequency filtering. So based on that, so this was the input data, and this is the diffraction section. So from here, red arrows shows the reflections which has been separated out so you can see this reflector it has been gone and this one gone so now we have only the diffraction section so when we migrate this diffraction section so we can get only the faults and the fractures also there is different methods so the second method which i use is a plane wave destruction diffraction separation method so when we compare these two methods, so obviously this method was more accurate because it was doing in frequency domain and this works in time and frequency both domain. And it's a base on it's a base on slope estimation. So the plane wave destruction was much more accurate than the uh, deep frequency filtering. Then we move to the complex model, which is Marmusi. So this is the zero offset section. Then this data is the separated diffraction using DFF, and this data is from PWD. So we found that the PWD method is much more better because it can remain leakage of the reflection in the data, but plane wave destruction can remove all the diffraction, all the reflection, and only separate out the diffractions. And also, if we look at this, uh, I mean, obviously, we don't know which method is better. So based on the quantitative interpretation, so we have observed. So this purple shows the plane wave destruction and the green one shows the DFF. So based on that, we can say that it can preserve the low frequency data in the low frequencies in the data. And also it performed the better preservation of high frequency of the data in the diffraction section. But DFF actually removes the low frequency and higher frequency from the data. Now moving to the uh, another uh, part, so which is normally used for classification. So over here you can see uh, this is a 3D model of carbonate field. So from here you can, if we have the time slice, so this is a time slice of the conventional migration. So over here, if you observe these black dots, what are these black and white dots? So actually these white and black dots are classifications, but it has been not, because it appears to be a, only black or white. So if we don't have the amplitude contrast, then it's, quite high, uh, quite difficult to interpret. But when we do the diffraction migration, so you can see here, this white and black amplitude has been resolved and the classification has been illuminated in the diffraction section. Furthermore, if you look at this part of the section, so these are probably a channels or inside some channel features. So this also give a more detailed information of the, <laughs> sorry of the subsurface. So this is a beauty of, I mean, this one is a conventional migration and on the right side is a diffraction migration. So these are the workflow for uh, a deep frequency filtering. Uh, you, this one is about plane wave destruction and the deep frequency filtering. How does it work? So, also, the important thing is that uh, I've done some projects, so I'm just explaining that one. Uh, so the another thing is how we preserve the signal. So let's say we are doing the diffraction migration, but the quality of data is not good. So that was one of the reasons. So I did perform some experiments and some research on that. So I used a plane wave uh, 
I use this optimum plane wave destructions methods on the different data set. So this is one of the velocity model, simple velocity model. Then you have the wave producing from the from the middle. So you can see how beautifully this wave is propagating here. So once we take the snapshot of this wave, so this is the low rank approximation using low rank approximation. So if we compare this modeling method from the finite difference modeling, which is this one, which I didn't show the animation here. So on the right side, which is a B figure, is a low rank model, which is coming from this data set. So you can see a lot of um, a lot of noise in this data. And, but in low rank modeling, we have the better preservation of the signal. If we plot the amplitude spectrum, so this is the amplitude spectrum of this one, and this is the amplitude spectrum of this above figure. So you can see a lot of disruption here, but in this data, you have very clear reflection. So that is also one of the factor uh, how you preserve the diffraction better way in your data set. So I have done this modeling stuff in the Marmusi model. Sorry, not Marmusi. It's a 6B model. So I have divided this model into two parts, which is this purple box and the green box. So let's look at the purple box here. So once we do the modeling from conventional modeling, you can see a multiple layers appears to be here. But when we do the advanced modeling, which is the lower end modeling, so you can see a separation of this reflector. But here you can see a lot of uh, these two reflectors appear to be one. And also we have the edge effects of the because of the boundary conditions. If you look at this section, which is a complex section, higher velocity within the lower velocity. So you can see this diffraction response on the left side figure is much more better. But in the right side figure, which is a conventional migration, so you will see multiple diffractions mixing with the reflection as well. So if we migrate this data, which is using the advanced migration, you can see uh, beautifully this is part is image. But in the conventional migration, like uh, uh, finite difference modeling, you will observe these type of challenges. I mean, the edge will not be, or the sharp part of this uh, body is not image because the waves does not travel properly inside this section. So if we compare this both sections, so the above one is a finer difference modeling. So in this you can see we have loss of reflection. So you see the reflector which was below is is gone and edges of the salt body, especially in this part, this part has been has been not resolved. And also this is a low resolution. But if you look at this data set, the below, which is using the low rank modeling, imaging with diffractions. I mean, obviously we preserve the diffraction properly. So over here you can see the reflector has been imaged and your edges and your amplitude recovery is better, which because amplitude is one of the one of the key factors later on for hydrocarbon prediction as well. So this is just a comparison quantitatively, which one is better, conventional or advanced imaging. So this is a proof. Then also we have, I have been working on a new method, which is optimum plane wave destruction. So this is the PWD I have already explained. The optimum plane wave destruction is a new method which I have submitted to geophysical prospecting. So obviously when we creating uh, a new method, so we have to apply on a simple model. Then we go to the complex, then we go to the real data. So I have been tested it on this model, which con which has the anticline, syncline, sharp edges, then the faults in the subsurface, high velocity, everything I have made it possible to be in the model. So when we acquire the data from here using low rank modeling, so this is the data. So this is a separated diffraction using plane wave destruction. And this one is a proposed method, which is optimum plane wave destruction. So if you compare these two sections from this top, you can see uh, there is a loss of 
amplitude, but it has a better preservation of amplitude. And if you focus on the red arrows, in red arrows, it shows the leakage of reflections. Like here, you can see this one, and this one you can observe. So this part has been eliminated. Mm -hmm. Then if you look at the uh, plane wave destruction migration and OPWD, or optimum plane wave destruction, so optimum plane wave destruction gives the better results. So just a big comparison. So this is PWD and this is OPWD. So if you focus here, this part, so this is PWD and this is OPWD. So the fault has been imaged properly. And also I have applied to the uh, real data from, from Gulf of Mexico for its salt body. So I have shown that this OPWD has been better preservation of diffractions. Then also, if you look at the complex model, which is the uh, which is the Marmousi model, so you can see here. I mean, this is exploding reflector migration, and this is the full wave plus diffractions. So this is before, and this is after. So you can see a lot of amplitude has been recovered. So also, I'm working on machine learning. I mean, as I mentioned, so I'll just wrap up this presentation. Maybe I'll take five minutes more. So the machine learning is obviously is a, it's a, I mean the new coming in uh, technology in every field of life. So also our objective was to develop the algorithm using machine learning techniques for diffraction preservation prior to migration, and also we try to improve the resolution in delineating complex structure and small reservoir. So how does it work? I'll not go into detail. So I'll just explain what we are doing here is actually we have the seismic input as a seismic data. Then in machine learning, currently I'm working on supervised machine learning. So when then we have the prediction. So after the prediction, we can get the desired diffractions. But in in future we will go for reinforcement learning as well so but but we ever we give it so that can observe so if, uh, just to give you an idea about machine learning so let's say if this is a seismic section from the top so you you will see a lot of features if you look at one section of the seismic data so maybe sometime with thousands of diffractions you will see or the millions of diffraction in the whole 3d data so we, we can't observe each and every diffractions manually. So that's why we have to come up with some convolutional layer model. So which have different layers, I mean different feature maps, how it can detect the diffractions, what type of diffraction, as I mentioned, based on velocity, uh, depth, and also the frequency. So it has the different patterns. So we have to key in all the pattern in our kernel model and then we have some activation layer in which we will put in all the types of diffractions. Then from there, we can get the prediction. So in this case, they have this spherical, rounded, or Newton rings, or this type of diffraction. So in our case, we can have the, let's say, if because of the fall, because of the fractures, or because of the discontinuity. So we can classify these diffractions based on the feature extraction. I've also come up with this model, uh, I mean this workflow. So in that we have the input data and we have two algorithms, which is ML1 and ML2. So one of them is using image segmentation. The second one is using multi-domain diffraction identification. So in Im image segmentation, what we do, we, we divide our image into different components. So let's say if we have first component, second and third component, so based on that, it will detect the diffraction response. But in the second algorithms, we have different domain of the diffractions. So based on domain, it will observe the diffraction response. But this all outcome from this either multi-domain or image segmentation, it, it will come into diffraction matching with supervised network. And then we'll combine the segment and domains. I mean, both domains and segment. And if either it's a true diffraction detected, 
If yes, we go for diffraction migration. If no, then we have to repeat this all method. So this is a simple model. Again, uh, we start from the sim simple model. So it's an input model, which is uh, constant velocity, variable density. Yeah, constant velocity. So when we look at this section, so it's a uh, constant velocity. So we don't have multiple diffractions mixing up. So you can see a simple first diffraction, second, third, and fourth. These are because of the fractures. So in the convolutional layer, we have multiple sort of diffractions. So it will come and repeat all the way and come up with the diffraction response. And in the machine learning seismic diffraction, so it will observe only the diffractions which is coming. So in, in this uh, machine learning approach, we can see this uh, fracture as well. So like here, if I zoom it in, so there will be probably a small fracture here. So that's why this diffraction hyperbola has been appeared. So be, these are because of the false four. So this is a simple velocity model, constant velocity. But when we move to the variable velocity, so in that you can see uh, because of the velocity change, the diffractions goes down. Then similarly in convolutional layers, it will go and match the diffraction response and come up with the different hyperbolic move out. So over here you can see this, this has been changed from the previous because of the velocity changes. So this is second, third, and fourth, and so on. So the another part of the uh, seismic uh, diffraction using machine learning, learning is a pattern recognition versus multi-domain deep learning. I'm working on that right now, but just to give you an idea, so machine learning approach uh, using pattern recognition is actually in that you don't have to separate out the diffractions. So you will use the pattern recognition. So we will give the reflection, diffraction, or the noise. So in the same section, you will observe either this is a reflection, the green one is diffractions, the blue is noise, but we don't have it here. And in deep learning, you can go more deeper. I mean, you can understand either it's a diffraction or reflection, or either it's a combination. So the right one, our this figure shows the diffraction and reflection together. Let's say the point where the diffraction and uh, reflection combines together. So I'm working on that as well, but deep learning will more accurately preserve these diffractions to image the subsurface. Also, they have been applying, there has been applying to the real data. So the diffraction, when it plotted to the data on the reflection, it will give you more better information. So uh, with that all, uh, I will uh, conclude my presentation. So the first point which I believe as a topic is the introduction. So understanding diffraction is a key for seismic processor and interpreter. More to the processor, but obviously the interpreter who is doing the QC of the seismic processing is also important. So ignoring diffraction might lose valuable information. Obviously, I've shown you multiple examples. So which you have to be or we have to be encountered that diffraction gives you a better response and giving you a highly uh, important information. Then integration of diffraction and reflection together make, makes the target more prominent, especially for the complex and fractures. Obviously, if you're looking at the only diffractions, it will not give you that much information. So you have to integrate your diffraction data with the reflection as well. So together, these two data will give you more, much more good information. And the last, uh, I've given a lot of recommendation based on the research to develop and imaging and reprocessing workflows that can contribute to an enhancement in the production of the field and also the field development for future. So you can also, I mean, if you, you think that uh, your area of interest is something you need the diffractions, uh, migration or diffraction response from the data, then probably you can change your reprocessing workflow.
So with that's all, uh, uh, thank you so much. And I would like to thank uh, University of Science Malaysia, as well as uh, School of Physics, Geophysics section for providing me the facilities. And finally, I would like to uh, also, uh, actually, I want to uh, give acknowledgement to UTP and Petronas because a lot of work I have I have done during my UTP time and also the Petronas, together with Petronas, we have done multiple projects with PRSB as well. And finally, I would like to thank Elise, I mean, for invitation and arranging this talk. With that's all, thank you so much. And if you have any question, I'm happy to answer.